Welcome to a new edition of This Racing Life, where this week we meet three trainers all at varying stages of their career, but with one common thread linking them all together, the green, luscious land of Wales. Here's what's coming up. As soon as he crossed the line, I think I burst out crying with, with Tori there, and um, it's amazing what, what racing can do, really, to sort of um, brighten up the bad days. Trying to uh, develop the yard, you know, there's no, no point hiding from that. You know, I borrowed and borrowed and borrowed a bit more, so uh, we've got to service the debt and meet our, uh, you know, requirements. I think I had a treble the first weekend I went over, and the guy I rode for said, we, we'll have a crack at the championship if you fancy, and then we were kind of there, I think, for the next 14 or 15 weekends on the bounce. Because when you're in racing, you think, oh, it's a hard job. And, but you put it against something like that, and maybe 18 hour days, and different shifts, and night shifts, and they're just a different way the world works. First up, we've come to the Hollies, the yard of notable jockey turned trainer Sam Thomas, to hear about some of his exciting young horses and his stable stars. And we're here to discuss how life has been after a pretty turbulent 18 months. I think I'm hopefully over it now, but at the time, mm. I think you sort of just get on with it. Um, ultimately, Di was the one that was very ill, so we all sort of uh, had to get on with it ourselves and not uh, not worry about um, what sort of we were feeling, essentially. When someone someone's, you know, sick like he was, mm. we all sort of got on with our lives, essentially, the best we could and, and sort of didn't feel sorry for ourselves. But, yeah, I think I remember going racing a couple of weeks after and... and uh, you know, people will say to me now that, you know, you, you look like a ghost uh, when you were at the races there. And, and, you know, like I say, you do what you do at the time to, to get on with get, get on with it all. And thankfully, I think, you know, the horses are an amazing tonic and mm. great uh, great for anyone with any mental issues, if you like, to, to work with animals is, is, is such a real treat, I think. We're very spoilt here. We have got, got some amazing horses. Um, mm. And I guess as a, as, a, as a jockey, I never really got much satisfaction of going to ride the lesser types uh, and... and Certainly, as a trainer, that's, that's, that rings true as well. And, and we're, we're, we're blessed here to have such an amazing horses to ride every day. So when you're riding 150 horses, 140 horses every day, it, it's sort of it's, it's you, know, you can't really call it a job, can you? So um, yeah. every sort of winner we're having, I felt mm. just had a bit more of a, of, 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 a, of a meaning and a bit more of a feeling for it. And to do well for the family, for, for his, his daughter Sarah and son Richard, uh, and obviously Jane, uh, they, they sort of you know all, all pulling together. So to to do well and have, have any winner was amazing. Our dancer was a star. He won it just a few days after uh, after the crash and probably one of the most emotional races I'd ever watched, really. Mm. Unfortunately, didn't go there, but as soon as he crossed the line, I, I think I burst out crying with, with Tori there. And um, yeah. it's amazing what, what racing can do, really, to sort of um, brighten up the bad days. You've obviously had a lot of experience going into plenty of the biggest yards. Is there anything that you really wanted to be part of your own setup from when you got going? Riding out in Ireland really sort of opened my eyes to a, li a little bit more as well. Um, and, and probably that's where the, the round gallop sort of ideas mm. have, have come in. Um, and certainly maybe the way we sort of train the horses as well as sort of things I've picked up in the last sort of four or five years, essentially, and probably not stuff I actually learnt when I was riding, but mm. um, yeah, it's been great. Like I say, Miss Walters has been a, a huge supporter of mine and without all his support, I, I most certainly wouldn't be standing here now. You've been sand gallop, it's, it's great to see. I don't know, I've read that you said that's a real big attribute to why the horses are so fit and they've obviously got this ability, they stay very well too. What is it about that gallop in particular that you're really pleased that you've got now? Yeah, I mean, it's quite unconventional. In, in fact, it's not actually round. Um, we sort of flattened uh, the area and sort of made it as big as we possibly could mm -hmm. with the area we, we were to deal with. So it's, um, you know, it's got a, a couple of tighter bends, but in a way it actually makes us ride a, a bit differently to maybe other round gallops and that we have to go very slow on there. Mm -hmm. um, we sort of probably learnt, uh, like we had a few horses pulling muscles and things like that early on when we were using it. So we certainly learnt that, that learnt the hard way if you like. So hence why we go very slow around there. And it just really conditions the horses, gets them to breathe properly. Um, she gets them in a nice routine, teaches them sort of how to relax ultimately, and it's amazing for the babies. Um, and, and sort of, I guess it helps them to develop those muscles as well because they're, mm. they are having to pull themselves out of a slightly deeper surface. So um, I think it certainly helps the horses if they maybe don't have the action for it on the race course, it certainly prepares them for it as best they can. It's obviously you've got the facilities. What is it about being maybe in Wales that you didn't have maybe in Lambourne? Yeah. I think uh, I think I probably learnt more by being here than I've you know being anywhere. Like like you mentioned there, Lambourne's fantastic, amazing facilities. But you, you know, you, you sort of especially for a young trainer, you're seeing uh, you know one trainer doing one thing on a Monday, another trainer yeah. doing another thing, and, and sometimes you sort of question yeah, right. yourself and takes focus off what you should be doing yourself. Sometimes, so mm -hmm. uh, by coming here, 
it's very much obviously uh, you know private facility and we're doing our own thing so uh, I think I probably learnt more from doing it myself um, making my own mistakes mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of learning learning that side of things so as good as Lambourne is I think this is you know this has been the making of us really. In terms of numbers you're, you, you probably consider yourself a smaller trainer in, in a big big C and you've seen what it's like being part of the Nichols team what it is do you, do you like the fact that you have a smaller team and that you're a, you're kind of sort of bespoke in that way and is that is that something that means you can be very sort of one-on-one -on -one with each horse? I think it gives you more of a chance to be one-on-one -on -one with a horse, certainly, yeah. yeah. I'd love to one day be training 100 horses, um, but as it is at the minute, I, I, I love it because we're, we're, like I say, we are a bit niche and, and we're, we're sort of dealing with, you know, very nice horses and um, it's great that I'm learning, you know, how to deal with, with, with the better horses, what races mm -hmm. to be planning them for. So um, I'm in a very unique situation and, and sort of, you know, it's what gets me out of bed every day, looking forward to coming to see these horses and, and, and planning where we can go and, and plotting your way. It's, it's so nice to be able to go and uh, compete with the, with the big boys. The thing I like to th think I do well is, is I'm just very honest about everything, really. I don't sort of, um, you know, try and hide anything. If the horses are not good enough or they're not quite right, I, I, I think I try and speak my mind and, and say that ultimately because otherwise it's going to you know bite you in the bite you in the in the, in the foot ultimately in, in long term so i think that's one thing that i do I try to do anyway is, is try and just be as open as i can if the horses maybe aren't quite you know to the level we'd like mm -hmm. then uh, more often than not sort of they can potentially find other homes and, and and do other things and um i'm in the lucky position that we do only want to, to have the best horses here and so does mr walters um, mm -hmm. it's very much a hobby for him um, so the key is to try and find these good Saturday horses and, and, and graded horses ultimately. And when you look at the the, num the horse you've got, it's say maybe 90, 95 percent are Mr. Walters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. But would you say, as a as as a, as a business, you're happy to bring in others? Would you would you want it to feel like it's quite open, or is it sort of half open? We certainly have a very sort of tight team at the moment, uh, and and doesn't really leave room to expand as it stands. Um, so that might be, you know, for, for another day, mm -hmm. um, but certainly we're sort of um, very much, you know, focused on the horses for Mr. Walters and, and, and sort of the horses we have here already. And touching on that, you've clearly got a kind of a, maybe nearly a type of horse. I always see that it's got the FR, you know, um, in brackets by, by them. You like the French breads. Maybe is that, I'm always curious to know, is that because of your time riding? Is that because Mr. Walters likes them? Or do you think that that's a, a type of horse that you really feel like you can nurture and get the best out of? Um, so as a trainer, I think you've got to be able to train every horse. So mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't, you know, say I particularly like to train a youngster over an older horse. But certainly for Mr. Walters' case, um, he's had great success buying horses from France um, as yearlings or, or two-year-olds from Arcana sales and other other good sales, and buys them generally through High Flyer and and and, and um, David Footer. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that way you're more likely to hopefully, um, you know, by buying you know a few at a time you're more likely to stumble across a nice one as opposed to spending two or three hundred thousand on a, on a, on a point of pointer which comes with uh, enormous expectation mm -hmm. um, so it's worked worked really well for, over the years like I say our dance is a perfect example and there's been many more um, who, who have sort of have been picked out as, as babies and when you're using those good bloodstock agents I think um, I think personally it's the way to do it. What do you need to go and look for to get that sort of edge to be able to sort of compete with the very best? I think it's getting harder and harder Jess and I think at, at the time when I was riding I just thought it was n the norm being down at pools and obviously Venetia's yeah. there were just grade one horses everywhere so I think it's certainly harder and now we're training and we're buying horses the way we are um, we're seeing how hard it is you know we are still buying the best horses from the sales that we go to mm -hmm. and is there a grade one horse in them? You still don't know. Uh, it's very, very difficult. I think the breeders in France are keeping hold of their horses a lot more, yeah. uh, which means there's less, less, less top horses going to the sales. Um, I think it's just very, very difficult. Yeah, you've got to sort of be buying the right horses and, and, and sort of right pedigrees. Um, and saying all that, there are horses that do slip through the net ultimately, so mm -hmm. you just need a lot of luck along the way. But I think if you are buying the, the nice, nice horses with, 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 with good, good pedigrees from the right people, chances are you're not going to be too far away. This, this is built literally in the last uh, six months or more, yeah, that's a, a Galloway. Willie, ma Willie goes mad for the Galloway, he's just he buy, tries to buy everything he can. Boban, yeah. uh, that's a manatee, he's a rocking man stallion. Okay, yeah. So, that's Doc, Dr. Dino on the right, the little grey. Yeah. And this is a new stallion, Moses Haas. Moses Haas. Who's the son of Martheline himself. Yeah. Um, Son of Marceline, so this is his eldest, I think, a two-year-old now. So it'd be interesting to see how they fare out. So yeah, these will all be broken uh, in the spring when we when we're quiet, when we've got got everything um, everything turned turned away for the for the, for the holidays and 
break them in quietly for a month or however long it takes and that's it then they go out to, out to grass then. Are you quite a positive type of person or are you, do you need to get given that positivity around you? Yeah I think yeah, I think coming from obviously being a jockey I was always one that actually probably relied on people giving me a kick up the backside sometimes you know and saying yeah. you know you can do this because it's, 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 a, it's a quite a tough sport when things aren't going away so I think yeah this is the most up and down industry you're ever gonna ever gonna experience I think we all know that yeah. the highs are amazingly high and uh, you know the next runner can bring you right back down again so mm -hmm. um, you've got to enjoy the good times but I think like I say I keep going back to it but dealing with the good horses that we are there's always something to look forward to mm -hmm. there's always something around the corner and there's always a race that we're plotting with a horse so um, yeah as, as sort of downbeat as you, you can be sometimes like I say I have to look at some of the horses with their heads over the doors to, yeah. to, to, to look forward to races to come. We're here at Pant Wilkin Stables, the training establishment of Tim Vaughan, who's taken a very multifaceted approach to training. It's not just about the horses, but about the business he's created here. We're here to learn a little bit more and speak to his son Ed about his career as a jockey. We built a sort of 120 box racing yard in what we in the bottom yard now and uh, um, you know we trained probably 500 winners out there everything was going great guns but then one season we had a we had a viral infection go through the horse and we just couldn't get rid of it almost and you know after lots of um, analyzing and various professors coming in and advice and me visiting hundreds of yards um, we just decided look the the sort of microclimate that I was sat in wasn't perfect for the size uh, of, of um, or number of horses we had mm. so we ended up building a, a what we call now top of the hill top yard um, a new barn and the horses just thrived there and I could see the obvious uh, differences in the health of the horses and the, the consistency in form and things so we ended up doing the whole top yard which you know was sort of circa 90 yeah. stables and things but obviously as you can imagine then that left sort of 120 odd stables in the bottom yard empty so um, I didn't really have any significant ideas for that at the time but um, I knocked the sort of last nail and screw in the top yard, all completed, all shiny and new offices and whatever else. I was so excited. And 10 days later, COVID kicked in. So, you know, we had to do something. Mm. We had a significant loss uh, of numbers, you know, through people retiring horses and, you know, just taking a review on, on their horses. We lost considerable amount, which obviously our turnover dropped. So I decided to sort of go head into uh, repurposing a lot of the, the um, bottom yard uh, stables into sort of like little business units and you know our own veterinary practice took a unit we got a, our rug washing company took a unit a, a little dog daycare center and animal physio and uh, sort of water treadmills and hydrotherapy pools and things so we just diversified that with people who we knew and sort of interconnected mm. with our own business really so uh, you know it seemed to work well it took a bit of energy and then I thought, right, we'll try and go a bit bigger. So we had sort of holiday lodges developed. I built six of those so we could have owners in. It, yeah. it, you know, it, it just interconnected with the horses. And we had that sort of momentary blip where three or four months where, you know, our hands were tied, couldn't do a great deal. And uh, it helped really. And it just gives us a, a nice diversified income stream. Mm -hmm. And now we've got the, the, the racing yard as we want it. And it's all um, all set out. Mm -hmm. Although we're trying to build a new swimming pool and uh, solarium and uh, sort of uh, equine rehabilitation centre in the, with it for the racehorses yeah. as well but uh, yeah it's, it's, it's been pretty busy three or four years. From there on into this sort of crossroads point did you ever think god I, how am I going to get back to where I was were you really thinking is this the right business for me? Uh, absolutely yeah it's no, no point telling any different I'd be telling lies if I mm. didn't say that you know uh, it, it's quite a mentally uh, draining <laughs> industry if the horses are flying you're doing well then uh, anything's possible and then you get on the other spiral where things aren't going your way yeah. then it's obviously it's, it's tough mentally it's tough on the staff it's tough on you know then you don't have the replenishment of young horses and so you know again I'm lucky I've got a, a good um, you know, group of, of, of really you know supportive owners who've come through thick and thin with me, and we've had some lovely days. But you know, fundamentally, to grow the business again, you need new influx of of both horses and owners, mm. and you don't get the horse unless you've got the owners to buy. So it, we. I suppose I had no expectation when I started. I trained a few point of pointers. I was Welsh champion jockey, a bad yeah. one at that, but <laughs> I did it and I loved it. And I'm just passionate. I just enjoy it, but against that because I didn't have that family dynasty um, mm. you know I, I I didn't have experience from being an assistant trainer it was all sort of going through my head trial and error and working mm. out what was right so when things aren't right you know you need that 
um, flow of money from a you know to to meet and service your debt, which I'd taken on plenty of trying mm -hmm. to uh, develop the yard. You know, there's no no point hiding from that. You know, I borrowed and borrowed and borrowed a bit more. So well, we got to service the debt and meet our you know requirements. So yeah, definitely when the numbers started dropping mm -hmm. um, for 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 COVID and, and and other various reasons, it was it was a tough old time. But um, hopefully now we've stabilised everything and mm -hmm. you know the the way forward is up again. It doesn't really surprise me that you've been really innovative because your training approach early days was always like that, race planning, you were very clever with A horses that you were buying and improving them but also finding those uh, those gaps to be able to get them to win races so you've actually been able to channel that into different businesses so is that always something that's just you've just really enjoyed and fostered in plenty of different ways so every angle in life I always look for an angle and try and mm -hmm. exploit that as best I can and that's probably what gave me that edge uh, when I started the racing job and it, it was just phenomenal fun and I loved it you know we had some yeah. great great memories um, but of course now it's, it's a different marketplace mm -hmm. you know fundamentally you know, in fairness to the, the industry, so competitive, trainers are doing so well, everything's so transparent, you know, mm -hmm. but my son obviously has come on the scene now and, um, you know, I was mad keen to get him going. So I thought, right, how do I commercialise this? I want to give him 20, 30 horses, mm. let's get the show on the road, uh, let's reinvigorate. And um, that's what we've done. So I bought, you know, quite a lot out of France, sort of three, four and five year olds, which have had a couple of runs, so should definitely win races, but also there's a lot of potential for improvement mm -hmm. so again it's trying to commercialize it whilst giving my son some opportunities yeah. me having fun you know I love it when I was eight I started pony racing in Ireland a bit really mm -hmm. um, did four or five years pony racing I was uh, very successful in that really I was very lucky I had some wonderful ponies to um, give me plenty of winners and then um, I had a couple of years off because I actually got quite tall for the ponies um, and they have certain weight limits and stuff, mm -hmm. um, which allow me to kind of focus on my schoolwork a little bit, uh, get all that done, and uh, now we're at the point of point stage, really. You started pony racing, and it's pretty unusual to uh, be Irish champion pony rider in, in Ireland based in Wales. Can you tell us a little bit more about that experience and, and what it was like with you and your family going off on the boat every weekend over to, to Ireland and what, and what that experience taught you? Yeah, it was... Um, it taught me a lot really, it taught me a lot of different things um, away from the riding, um, just mm. like kind of organisation and timing and stuff because obviously we'd have to be back the next day for school on a Monday morning. Mm. Um, we went over the one weekend and I think I had a travel the first weekend I went over and the guy I rode for said we, we'll have a crack at the championship if you fancy and then we were kind of there I think for the next 14 or 15 weekends on the bounce. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was definitely tiring and hard work but um, I look mum and dad were very supportive and they did take me over every weekend and it was, it was brilliant to gain that experience and you're now obviously an, an amateur you've had we've seen your rides under rules you've seen um also and heard about what you're doing in the point to point circuit how much of a thrill has this last few months been for you and obviously for your family to kind of take the next step if it was in your in your riding career yeah it's been brilliant it was well it's been a bit of a surreal start to be honest mm. um having two years off race riding and kind of jumping straight back into it and riding two favourites around Cheltenham having, having four winners pointing, is, is, it's been crazy but oh, look, I've enjoyed it so much and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the season, it's what I love doing and hopefully we can make the most of it whilst, whilst my weight's are, uh, on my side really. Well, I used to always see your name at Doncaster and the likes. That would be your kind of your yeah. biggest shot window, yeah, and you and you love that because. Do you think that still does exist? You still have hope that there are horses out there, or do you feel that you have to go right back to the the grassroots now? Uh, back to the grassroots. I think what what I was buying in those days at Don, you know, we'd go up to Doncaster and buy anything from fifteen to thirty, yeah. and I wouldn't have one owner. You go there, you put your your head on the block and just take your chance and. Um, you know, I'd be flat out in the car on the way home by this, mm. by that. That's why I bought this. This is the rationale. This is the, this is why I think it'll improve. You know, age, maturity, handicap, whatever that may be. But they're gone, and the the core reason for that is the Irish. Uh, in when I started in you know in the crux of it in 2008, it was the recession in Ireland. Mm. You had lots and lots of trainers in Ireland. You know, you had those big 28 runner fields, 30 runner fields. It was a horse who finished sixth or seventh. They get overlooked at in Ireland. Come, in Britain in a north 100 handicap round X 
racetrack, you know, with eight runners, it would hack up, mm. you know, so you could get those winners. Of course, now in Ireland, it's so polarised. Again, you've got your, you know, your Willie Mullins, your Gavin mm. Cromwell, your Gordon Elliott, um, Henry de Bromet, you know, those four or five trainers, they, they contain the lion's share mm. of the quality animals. They're such good trainers. When they come over to Britain, really, you're not improving them from fitness, you're not gastroscoping them, and you're not truck heel washing them. It hasn't not been analyzed. It's all been done, really. You're just looking for a down, you know, a, a drop in grade or a freshen up of a yard or a different environment for them to reignite them a mm. little bit. But you haven't got that consistency of horses, like in two, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, they were just coming over by the lorry load. And there were so many opportunities, like, you know, it's like a, quid, um, a kid in a sweet shop, yeah. You know, yeah, let's buy, 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 buy. I just couldn't help myself. It was a drug. But of course, now they go there and, you know, you analyse it and you think, well, wait, what's my angle with this horse? Mm. Where can I improve it? And of course, really, they come from four or five or six yards. You know, it's, it's hard to do that. So that marketplace just isn't like it was. The flat horses, you know, I just love buying, mm. you know, a stay in pedigree finish for six or 16 in a, you know, handicap for some art press or being yeah. quite fine. So put over hurdles, slow the pace, couple of hurdles, woof, bullet, they were like bullets. But now, of course, the foreign market's yeah. buying those. So what they were, you know, I remember I had a little horse, Architrave. You know, he won four on the bounce, ended up in the triumph hurdle. I bought another, it was 15 grand, I think it was. I bought yeah. a little one, Rupestrian, four grand, you know, of um, Mark Johnson's. He won five on the bounce, ended up in the in the um, triumph again. You know, they're good, fun horses, but cob, like me, you know, those horses are making 80 grand as a, yeah. as a 60 rate horse. So it's just changed, you know, the, 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 the um, marketplace for our type of horse that we've traditionally did well mm. with is closed. So you, you're always looking for an angle, and mm. but it tends to be now for me, you know, the younger store horses, perhaps point to pointers, creating my own young horses. Yeah. Um, and really, you're just in the game with everyone else. You buy a nice store, you know, you, you, you know, your Doncaster, your, your Gops, your Tattersall store, sales, and see how you go. And, mm. and it's a simple, and just keep going through enough and hope, hope you're lucky. We've now made the journey from Wales back into England and Roughton near Swindon to meet Welshman Robbie Llewellyn, who's made a flying start to his training career. We've come to find out a little bit more about him and his aspirations. We always had ponies outside the back door from a very young age. Um, and then did all the pony club, pony racing. That probably was the turning point for me within the racing world was doing the pony racing, um, got the bug then. And then, yeah, dad had, always had a couple of point of pointers and mm. my mum's brother rode, rode as a successful point of point jockey. So that was always around. And then, yeah, it was probably more point of pointing scene that that's how I started. And I was very lucky there was two big yards down the road from us with a hundred horses with Tim Vaughan and Evan Williams training. So. Um, that kind of got me into the rules world then and then following on from that I I worked for David Brace for a, a good mm -hmm. while with the point of pointers and obviously the stud as well alongside it with Dunraven stud and yeah I was very lucky we had a lot of success with the pointers whilst I was there and lucky to see Connor Brace come through as a as a young jockey from mm -hmm. the pony racing through to the point of pointing and yeah that kind of got us going and yeah, it was always a dream then to train on my own, but I was never quite sure whether we'd be able to afford or be able to really set up on our own with the costs of it to do it. And yeah, came here two years ago with three horses. Mm. We owned two of them ourselves and had one paying owner, which I think was Sarah's mother at the time. And yeah, it's just grown and grown on that. And then like we've been very lucky with good owners who mm -hmm. basically sent me horses when we didn't have a license ready for us to take the license out. and. Yeah, like anything, success and a few winners has just helped along the way and yeah, it's changed to what we do now. From a young guy up until now, you've seen Wales sort of develop and you're probably quite proud of being a part of that. How much was being around what was really dynamic at the time a real influence to you? I think it was a massive influence to see people from our area do so well when mm. winning a grade one tracks with grade one horses and you just think if they're able to do it mm. surely you can have a go and look that's what you want you look up to those they're probably my peers who are sort of 10 or 15 mm. years older than me but they really got the bug going and that's what you want to achieve and if someone from where you're from is able to do that you'd like to think you are so mm. um but yeah, it just took us to probably a different level, looking at what they were able to do under rules. It was always from where I was brought up, the point of pointing was kind of the big scene and what we did, whereas under rules was that step above that you just always think is too high to get to. Yeah. But 
with those yards being able to compete on the big stage, you just think it wasn't such a big step to go and jump into that world, I suppose. When you came here to a yard that obviously had been doing a lot of pre-training, what were you keen to sort of have from a from a sort of the terrain and, and the kind of facilities wise? I suppose we we're, we're totally different in the terrain to what I'm used to being being a Welshman. There's hills yeah. everywhere, <laughs> so um, we're flat as a pancake pretty much here, apart from our grass gallops that rise a little bit. So we had to do things different. I think our biggest thing was keeping horses healthy. That was probably my biggest thing taking away from Tim's was if you can keep them healthy, you can train them harder and then hopefully it all sort of slots in. So we had to adjust the way we train, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously you learn to use the facilities you've got. And yeah, our way we train is probably totally different from what I've done before, but it seems to work for what we do. And if we can keep them fit and healthy and then hopefully you can go to the races on the weekend and be competitive. What came first was it you know the boxes the place or was it I need to have the right gallop and then everything needs to fall in what what, what was really important to you? The, yeah the most important thing for me was the stables and the environment mm -hmm. um, I thought we could adjust other things facilities wise mm -hmm. you can always change change on them but if you haven't got them sleeping in the right place mm -hmm. then you weren't going to get that that bit right so that was probably the key thing for us was to have a healthy yard and mm -hmm. um, then I thought we could adjust anything else facilities wise around it. Can you talk to us a little bit about the last few months in particular and what the you know the, the horses are doing to, to help you in your career? Yeah it was massive I didn't really want to be known as a summer trainer and I know when a lot of people start up they get the ball rowing through and through the summer but mm. I didn't want to be that person that was banging winners through the summer then October comes and you're nowhere to be seen so mm. we were quite proactive that we didn't run a lot of the bunch till October mm -hmm. um, and then obviously we had a few which were well handicapped and we've just been able to get a role with them and they've stayed healthy and I got a very good team of staff which I think is massive in these times and it's just worked and then we've been lucky again with supportive owners that have given us a few bit more money to spend and um, it's just worked out that we've had better horses and been able to place them well and mm -hmm. yeah, the other winners have kept coming and did I really think we'd be where we are now this time last year? No, but it's, you just got to keep rolling with it. And they're still at a, a, a level, you were telling us earlier, that there isn't a horse that you spent more than 12 grand on because, you know, that's what you could afford to, to spend. So do you think they're punching a little bit above their weight in terms of what they're, what they're achieving? Yeah, I think they definitely are. And it probably helps having a good agent with us. Um, Dan Asprey does a lot of buy-in with me. Um, and they are all punching probably... They've gone, like I always thought, they'd win one or two races at their level, but they've just all progressed nicely, and there's probably four or five of them which have mm. done that now, which has been lovely to see. Mm. Um, and yes, look, we didn't have a lot of money to spend, so we had to start at the bottom and just try and look at a different angle outside the box to be able to achieve that, and it's paying off now, which is brilliant, really. It's been well documented, obviously, that you've been part of the film industry, but does that? do you think that's benefited you in a way that you've been able to see what you really want out of life you've been able to dip into a very different industry you still have a bit of work that you're doing in the film world but really it's always been racing and getting it and just and just and cracking on with it yeah like racing is that bug you can't get rid of and mm. look I was fortunate enough to work in another industry and work in the the film industry alongside the devil's horseman and sometimes it just puts life in perspective when you mm. see how different worlds work because when you're in racing you think oh, it's a hard job and but you put it against something like that and maybe 18 hour days and different shifts and night mm. shifts and they're just a different way the world works. And I think it just puts perspective on things that actually being around racehorses, doing your hobby every day, yeah. it's a nice way of life and an enjoyable way of life. For you and for people watching and trying to understand what the Robbie Llewellyn way is, what do you think is, makes you that little bit different to someone else? Or what would you like to hope that people see from your horses that might not be, with, might not be the same at other yards? Um, I suppose we look outside the box a little bit more. And that's mm. probably because I've worked in different worlds and mm. trained horses in a different discipline, not just to be fast, I suppose. Mm. Um, like we try to get in their minds, try to do things totally different. And I'm... One of those people that I won't be rigid. I'm open to any option with any horse. If the staff think we should do something different, we do it. We mm -hmm. always we're willing to try something. Um, look, I'd like to be known that we get our horses very fit and we place them as best we can. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that works and we're competitive because we do that. So yeah. going forward, then hopefully that, that will help us and stand us in good stead. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode and a massive thank you to Sam, to Tim and to Robbie. And we look forward to you joining us for next week's edition of This Racing Life.